Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Now? <laughs> Don't listen to the man in the balcony. <laughs> in his own balcony. I'm Terry Helton. I am the president of the Ventura County Interfaith Community. And it is a privilege to be here, Imam, in the mosque, and for you to be so hospitable to have us. Uh, my husband is Timothy Helton. He happens to be the secretary. The vice president is Bobby over here. And the treasurer is Shanaz over here. So we have people here that are very important to our community. We have been in existence since 2005. I'm going to make this really quick because my husband said that we are 10 minutes late, but we've been waiting for some people to come up for prayer. So we've been in existence since 2005. Up until 2020, we basically did the Feast of Faith every year and had some forums, especially through the Catholic University series. And then that wonderful pandemic hit us and we learned to do some new things. And that's what has brought us to different, to different houses of worship to have some forums. And once a month, one month, we have an individual faith, and the next month, we have a forum. And we've done some really interesting things. And those who didn't make it to Ventura last month missed a great talk on the, uh, the Latter-day Saints, the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints temples, which are not churches. It's a long story, but it's well <laughs> So we will just make it brief. Our Feast of Faith is going to be November 5th. So we will not be having a forum in October this year. This will be the last forum until uh, no, till the new year, I believe. Yes. yes. Oh, wow. So the Feast of Faith will be at the uh, Church of Jesus Christ for Latter-day Saints in Camarillo, on uh, Paseo Camarillo. That's right. 1201 Paseo Camarillo. I think that's right. Uh, nothing wrong with my friend. <laughs> so um, it will be at four o'clock, and I will be. We will be sending flyers out, so be watching for those. And in the meantime, I get to introduce the moderator tonight, who is my husband. And I'm not going to read from anything. I've been married to him for 49 years, and he is my best friend in my whole life. And I, I am who I am because of him. So I'm going to say that. <laughs> he, he, is, he is also Dr. Helton. He has a PhD in anthropology of religion and a couple of masters behind that, too. So I made that very short tonight. He is the guy who does all the work to send out the notices and to keep us up to date. So Timothy Helton, Dr. Helton, would you take us forward? Thank you, best friend. <laughs> Uh, you, you've lost your presentation here. So yeah, tonight we're talking about weddings. Um, we talked about funerals uh, three or four months ago, and we thought, well, we should talk about something that's a little happier than funerals. And so uh, a couple of months ago, we presented, um, uh, help me out of time, who presented? Mike Watford for Judaism. Uh, uh, Arash for Baha'i. Arash's mom for Baha'i. Arash's mom for Baha'i, yes. And one other. And tonight? And, and it's my far for Hinduism. <laughs> <laughs> and one other. <laughs> so. um, I, should, I should get this stuff ready before I get up here. Um, tonight we have uh, Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism presenting. And we typically present in the order that the religions appeared first on earth. And so Buddhism will be first, and I'm going to introduce to you now to, followed by Christianity and, and winding up with Islam. And uh, Venerable Thapo Mpochi was recognized as the eighth tulku and trained in the um, Dandan Shratsi Monastery. From 1975 to 1980, he worked at the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives in Dharmashala, India, and served as a special cultural advisor for the Smithsonian Institution, Tibetan Library. In 1983, he moved to Northern California and has worked as an activist for the Tibetan cause in various capacities as a founding board member of the Bay Area Friends of Tibet in 1983, 
a board member and co-founder of the Tibetan Association of Southern California in 1990, president of the Tibetan Association of Northern California in 1994, and as coordinator of the Tibetan Resettlement Project beginning in 1993. He currently lives in Santa Barbara and is a co-founder of the Santa Barbara Tibet Summit. Thapo has an incredible story. Born in Tibet, he escaped into the Himalayas for five years as a child, carried on the monk's shoulders and back with the group that followed the Dalai Lama to India. Thapo lived and studied in Gandan Sharksi Monastery, I hope I'm saying that right, Thapo, yeah, he did. and became a monk, Lama Rinpoche, and served the Dalai Lama and is his lifelong follower and friend. So please welcome Thapo. Thank you. Um, before you be, before you start, I just want to let everybody know we will take questions and answers mm -hmm. after all of the presentations. So hold your questions, and we'll have a good Q and A time after all three have presented. Mm -hmm. It's all yours. All your Let me get this out of your way. <laughs> so, so happy to see you all again and again. So that's uh, wonderful. Everybody looks like a healthy and happy. So thank you for, very much for opportunity to give to me to speak part of your panel and also be a community. And I uh, really appreciate and also I'm very respect and appreciate for the Ventura County Interfaith Group. You all bring a lot of the very special services to the community. And that is a very precious, very special. And we need that, especially this moment, we need all the different interfaith group together to meet, to make the world better and peace, more healthier. So, so I'm glad to be a part of your community. And so I'm very Happy to join here tonight. And uh, tonight's subject is uh, about a wedding, right? Marriage. Weddings. <laughs> okay. In the Tibetan, so they at the Buddhism is kind of wow, or the different the Buddhist there for so many Japan, in every country different like Thailand and uh, different country have a different uh, uh, culture, different systems. And uh, Tibetan, even Tibetan Buddhism. The culture is on Tibet, but in Tibet also, wedding is a uh, marriage system is uh, all based on different uh, your armed locations. So in Tibet, we have uh, three different regions. We call uh, Central Tibet, we have called Uza, and uh, then we have called Amdo province, then we have called Kham, three big different provinces. So each province have a different, kind of little different style, different because of uh, a yeah, different way to grow. And uh, but Tibetan uh, is uh, based on Tibet, as you know, it is a very isolated country and is a very state yourself in Tibet. And also early age, early years is more like a nomadic life. It's a nomadic life. So and also about returning to the marriage. Uh, Tibetan monks or lamas doesn't involve in that aspect because it is a they call a secular system uh, aspect. So religion is not going to involve into the like for example like lamas not going to do the marry somebody and all the lamas not going to the monks not going to involve between these families matters uh, or the or wedding kind of this uh, only. What they do is involve is uh, part of the service for blessing and uh, blessing and uh, also but but Tibetan based on Tibetan majority Tibetans are Buddhists so Tibetan culture is uh, more like the Buddhist culture even we have a Tibetan there are a few Islamic and also a few uh, Christianity. There are different faiths, but still we have culture is based on Buddhist culture, kind of environmental, you know, so, so we have no problem with that. So 
we keep it in wedding. Everything is uh, we call a Buddhist culture. Basically, it means every aspect what we family or to reunite, it has to be involved with the first. First purity is based on compassion, love. We believe love is not only for love somebody you and me by self. The love is something to reach to the whole community. So that was compassion, and also uh, Tibetan usually. Uh, now it's different. Before Tibetan, we don't have like a court marriage. If the marriage is a family, two family together, and the marriage and the community is a witness, and uh, the the two family leaders will come together, and then community leader will come and they will be the witness and they will be. That's how they met and respect. And then that's how they. There's no like a court marriage there, and also. We don't go to the Lama to marry and uh, do the vow. They don't do that. Yeah, they basically, they strictly do with the family and the community. And uh, so, uh, and also, long time ago, Tibet is mostly is uh, engaged by the parents or the families. Marriage is more like engaged. It's not like a, somebody, uh, you know, like. Now it's different. Now the difference because you know it's not the really culture geography. Long time ago, Tibetan is a very uh, isolated country, and also there's no transportations, so the no people will go not much mingling to one east to west because all people who grown up people who grown up in a, within a community within this geographically in that area, so definitely they have. A, uh, people, the parents who connect, who do the, uh, to uh, connect, they will, first they will, of course, they will be, have some kind of agreement between the, between the whoever married boy and the girl, but still the parents are very important to, they are the who really try to find the uh, right person for their own uh, children. And uh, then, for example, like the somebody boy, they're looking for the bride, the parents will look to the other bride, and then their other other parents has to be agree. But uh, final, last final, you know, no matter what, still the the boy and the girl, they have to be agree uh, agree on the uh, agree upon. But they will they will convince anyhow, they will convince, make sure they will agree. <laughs> that's how the culture does not. And also because, and the community involved, because uh, the reason why the community involved is because one, the ones who are married and two family became together. So two family together became a very powerful in within this community. So community has to be a very responsibility. These two, two are right, they are doing the right connection, right purpose. And it's very important. So that's uh, based on their own is basically to uh, not only two person be happy life. Basically, mainly at the community be and these people together will be serve the better community in this community. So that's why the community is very important to involve. And uh, then they want to be involved. And then once they agree, then there's another level. Another level meant then that is uh, very important to go to the astrology. And then we never know what astrology will say, that's the right soul or right boy. <laughs> so that is the, that is the astrology's uh, level. Once you go to the astrology, astrology have to find out that the bride, the groom, wherever they're there, find and they will put together and they will match or not matching, there's some problems, then they will have some issues, and then this will be take for uh, for a while. Yeah. Well, if somehow it began, we believe we, there's a certain thing we believe there's a karma, we call karma. So there's no regret. Certain issues they said no, no, that's a definitely that's a true, too extreme, and then blah blah blah, and then whatever the astrology comes very serious kind of thing, then family will be say okay, that's our karma. We go to the next. That happens sometimes. It's very not. It's very few. Very few. Mostly, 
is not negotiable, but mostly there is different way, different way to do the rituals and a different way to do some kind of they bypass that uh, negativity and then mm -hmm. purify it and then back to the normal. But even they have a little different kind of like uh, not matching, but they can do some different different way, uh, you know, to do bypass. So that kind of thing our um, culture is a little different than the Indian culture. And uh, once, uh, uh, because of uh, once your parents agree and the community is very uh, supportive, and then they will finalize to, then that family officially come to the, come to the boy and ask to, uh, the, because, because the boy will, the, the girl will go to the boy place. So that the, the mother will ask them, they will bring the tea, they have to bring the chang, we call chang here for wine, like a wine. They have to bring the wine and uh, they have to bring some food, they come to visit the family, they will officially say, okay, we are having, we love to have to be, uh, meet you and we want to be your son to marry our daughter, blah, blah, blah. and then they will discuss, they will take a long time to discussions so traditionally. And once they drink the wine, once they drink, and drink wine a couple of times, that means they are accepting. Once they don't refuse to drink the wine, then still you have to negotiate, still you have to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's a sign. So the, one of the parents, they're getting meetings, other, other relatives, they keep looking behind the door. <laughs> the one, once they're accepting the, the beer and drink and they're kind of like a cheering, then that means they are coming to the agreed. And then after that, they will go to the astrology. After once the astrology, the, that was the happened, the good sign, everything went well, then they go to the time, the day. The day also has to go through the astrology, that which month, what day. Then her, she have a different sign, the boy have a different sign, that they have to find out the different way to get the right. Uh, so it take, usually it takes like a year to get all around to get the finalized. Mm -hmm. right? oh. Once everything just went well, then officially your father will talk to seriously to your, your son, and the other person will talk to your daughter, and uh, they, they, will, they will have some then sometimes they have a little bit uh, complicated situations, but anyhow, they are, uh, in culture, they, are, they will agree on, agree on that, uh, uh, agree. And once you agree, then finally they will go to part of the wedding. Then you have to go to the, the, the boy side, have to go to the, the bride family to pick up the, the pick up the bride and to take it to the, your home. So that means that, that's a family home. Sometimes uh, Tibet is uh, no, like most like an American life. And this is here, right now, right now maybe like a, from Santa Barbara to Ventura. But that time, that time for them is a very long journey. <laughs> maybe a whole two days walk or year walk, you know, like to take the, by horse, by horse. They have to take a horse to pick it up. So then that horse has to be a white horse, mm -hmm. white horse. And uh, right now I have a picture to show you, that one picture, there's a car, uh, there's a one. Uh, the horse did not come yeah, out of the picture. I showed you one out of the first one. The um, horse did not come from No, not the horse, there's a no, car. The horse. Oh, the, the car. car. Oh, the car. Oh, the car. Oh, the car. And it oh, was the white car in the background. Yeah. 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 It, well, I don't think it was a Because mistake. now, in America, we don't have Here, this car. one? Yeah, but this is now a new horse, a new modern <laughs> horse. <laughs> and it's white. But okay. modern horse. This is the, I, I, because I didn't, I didn't took the download any picture from the previous or the other people's picture because I don't want to make sure they're copyright. So I took my own picture. So yeah. this is my copyright. So <laughs> because this is my son, younger son married in July, a couple of months ago. So. I was there to, to, to go to, this is ready to go to, go to get a meet a bride. So this is our horse. This is a horse. That's symbolic saying. So it has a color, those uh, 
when we give the bad elements, then the color usually they put across here. At the, uh, uh, the five different colors, there's a five different elements. So it's a symbolic for the, for the five elements to be uh, equally. Uh, so that's why even when you get, even people want to get, people get happy, happy, life or happy is more like happy in your body, minds, you know, elements uh, equally, they come. Once your element can different way, then it get, you get sick, you get some problems. Happy. So that's what we, we have to use uh, uh, five different elements to put this, this is our horse too. So you go to the, go to the bride house and the family, and but we already have a, they're, they're, that's a uh, kind of a culture, they're, they're already waiting for you and we go there and they receive you and once you receive, we, and then the father will talk to you and the father and I have a picture of it too. Father and they talk, they talk, we'll spend a little time and then you know, slowly they will bring the, the their daughter to us, you know, like officially to introduce. And uh, once we introduce, and then I have a couple of pictures. Not that one. That's they only got one. this one, they both. That's the last one. That's the that's the last one after they married. The after the yeah, the, the other mm. you had no attachment on the other one. Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I put the uh, I put all the next because I looked and there was no attachment. Okay. This one, not a. There's nothing. Not a, yeah. Okay. That's a close up of the white horse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Then anyhow. So the bride will come, and uh, then after that we have a celebration. That there's uh, some kind of like a rituals to do. Some, is this um, a picture you were looking? Oh no, this is the one. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Let's see if I can yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that one. This is my other son. This is my uh, yeah, there this is my other son. son. He carried. This is very important. We carry that one. That's the lead. It, uh, when we go to the to the new. Uh, uh, my younger son's house, they will, this is the lead that lead the, from before the horse it will do. This is the, called will of life. Will of life is a very important to bring the children to the understanding of your life. That means, uh, that means you are ready. This is celebration for the happy to be united, but this is a life. This life means you are be, when be happy, sometimes you have peace. Unhappy, whatever. This is the will of life. So your life is ready. Your life settled to be together. Together means to always be happy. So this is the life of the nature of the life, the will of the life. So that's what we that's carry. What that. This is. Let me see if I can get it. That's yeah. what this is right here. Yes, yes, yes. Oh. This is my English group. The blue of will of life. That's a samsara. So understanding of the will, all nature of the life is. You know, um, that's what we promise, you know, even we, I think I'm mad that we do that, we promise whether you are happy or not happy, we'll be together. So, that's symbolic that, so you be ready, symbolic that. Yeah, he carried that one, and this is the, this is the room, this is the, her best friend. Our best friend is uh, in Tibetan too, we always have an important best friend with her, when they go to join the other place. And then this is a very important thing. This one, this is the little stick with the, you know. This back here with the color? Yeah. Uh, it's very important. This important means once this one, when we put that one, that means from today, you are the our part of our family. Mm -hmm. So this is symbolic that uh, you are part of family. And at the same time, there's another, another, uh, another meaning. Another meaning is, so this family, and here a new family, so you're taking the journey, so this family, this area location have a protector, spring, different protector. And this journey, this local have a different protector. So she's living from here to here, between there, there's no protectors. So this is a kind of like a wife, a Wi-Fi model. Because this is where he carried the disprotectors energy together to protect her until you reach there. Reach there. Once you reach there, introduce other protectors as a spirit 
here combined and then we can that energy together keep that in the home forever so that means these two protective people together is only the positive so that's what the, that's the name we call dada you know that's a, that's a very simple if that she has to as soon as the, we put that on her that means she accepts she is free to the new home and that's a real place and that's uh, symbolic and also the energy particular energy brain there once you have that one until you get there until she's finalized special ceremony everything done then that that stick will just stay in the your home for forever so that's the new tradition so this kind of small symbol kind of like a, a tradition different than a western western but um, other than that basically similar we are celebration giving the uh, we don't do the cake in Tibet, but uh, we do a lot of food. Yes, food's a lot of research, a lot of research. Cakes we, is new, but now in America, it, we all do the cake, cake curry, baby, baby, cake curry. Then we do, we do a lot of dance, a lot of drink, and people, all the community will invite it, and their own community will be introduced. And uh, well, traditionally, when the girl leaves, the most difficult part. When the girl leaves from their home to the other new, that's the moment is a very difficult. Even they, everything is involved, but sometimes she rejects to leave. And sometimes uh, take for a day, sometimes she takes too seriously, she couldn't go emotionally. Because of this man, like uh, America here, once the family, she moved from their family, she became that family. And then if uh, she kind of like a and there is not really, I mean, there will be definitely can be communicated. Still, that's a new place. Mm -hmm. So that's what she has, a, her family is far away. So as, as I told you, right now, the Ventura and Santa Baba is close. From, from that time, it's too far, too far. So she has a lot of emotional, have to deal with that moment, that moment. So sometimes uh, it took a long time, and so that happened. We have to have a uh, community leaders and uh, her best friend, everything has to be, uh, you know, give her a lot of energy, give her the energy positive to bring them. You know, some, sometimes traditionally they had to carry her because she doesn't want to leave. <laughs> Two thin people were carrying. <laughs> it happens sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. So, yeah. yeah. I think that, uh, yeah, that, so this is uh, just an example. This is how auspicious uh, dance they offer to them. But they, they will be in there, and then yeah, this is traditional. And then you have to know that they have the apron. Apron means married. The girl that I have apron means that she's still single, she's not married yet. So apron is a pop, like a ring, like a ring. As soon as you married, they give you the apron. And <laughs> apron means that you become in charge of the house. Yeah. <laughs> in charge, ready to cook. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Christianity, Buddhism uh, came on, on board about 5600 BCE, and of course Christianity uh, developed around uh, zero, C, 0 BC or 0 CE. So our next speaker is, uh, is, uh, represents Trinitarian Christianity. The Reverend Julie Morris is a priest in the Episcopal Church who serves as a pastor, El Osama, of Mount Cross Lutheran Church of Camarillo. Thanks to a full communion partnership between the two denominations. Ordained in 2001, she has served throughout Ventura County in parish ministry in the university, hospital, and elder care chaplaincy. She was one of the founders of the Abundant Table and Organic Farm Ministry, and she is a graduate of Loyal Marymount University, Bachelor of Arts in Theology, Boston College, a Master of Arts in Theology, and the Claremont School of Theology with a Master of Divinity. She and her husband, Paul, Debaucher 
live in Camarillo, California, and they have three daughters. And you look surprised, Julie. No. Was <laughs> <laughs> that it? Come on out. I, I, I want to say one more thing about Julie. Julie, Julie helped us found. I was going to say, she was in our living room the night we found her. In 2005. I, I am so proud that oh, I was part of that. Yes. We're proud to know you too, kiddo. Well, thank you so much. Is this on? Yeah, I should pull your. Yeah, you want me to pull it up now? I was was thinking about how fortunate our community is to have this interfaith group. When we are having conversations with other people and they're bringing up another religion as if it's um, abstract, we think of faces. We think of the people that we know who are part of these different religions, and um, it matters. It makes a difference. We can say, um, we can kind of call people on the stereotypes that they may have of others. So it, this is a real gift. Thank you, Terry and Ken. Um, That's everybody, Julie. It's ever, it, it takes a community, I know, but it also took parents. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. I got to dig up my wedding picture for this. Oh, oh, um, that is my husband Paul and I, 27 years ago. We just had our 27th anniversary. Um, and so I took a picture. I went through our photo album, you know, the old fashioned photo albums, and took a picture of the picture. Um, so, dearly beloved, um, the, I'm an Episcopalian, and we come from the Church of England. And you know, the Church of England has the Book of Common Prayer that really. Um, set the uh, foundations and traditions in a lot of ways for the marriage services that we see in the media. So when you see um, services or you hear phrasing, um, often it comes right from the Book of Common Prayer. So, dearly beloved, we are gathered here today, right? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've all heard that, or most of us have heard that. Um, so that comes from the Book of Common Prayer. I'm so aware that Christianity is a tree with so many branches. And so I'm speaking as an Episcopalian, so I can speak pretty um, authoritatively about that tradition. And I work and serve in a Lutheran congregation, so I can speak a little bit uh, with some accuracy about that tradition. But I'm aware that there's such diversity within Christianity, so don't take what I say to be true for all Christians. But I think generally the um, contours of a wedding ceremony would be recognizable to um, most Christians, and some of the elements would be consistent across Christian denominations, but there would be definitely some differences. So I just want, you know, that caveat. Um, so, thank you. So when uh, we talk about marriage and my tradition, there's three words that come up a lot. The first one is sacrament. And um, in the Episcopal Church, marriage isn't a, a sacrament in the same sense that baptism and Eucharist are sacraments, but it's called sacramental, um, which means that not every Christian has to get married to be a faithful Christian, but it is available to them. But we would say in our tradition that baptism and Eucharist are necessary for all Christians, but marriage isn't, but still it has um, the depth and importance of a sacrament, which means we believe that in that ceremony, God shows up. That the grace and the love of God is given in that ceremony um, and to that couple, and that we trust that the love and the grace of God will continue to work through that, uh, in and through that couple. So that's what we mean by sacrament. Um, we talk about marriage as a covenant. It's not just a legal contract, but it's a covenant, a sacred promise between two people um, that's made similarly in the context of community. So that there have to be, whenever I cannot officiate at a wedding unless there's two witnesses. So the couple and two other witnesses. To just say this isn't just something that the couple is doing, this is something that the community is a part of. Um, and then it, at the start of every service, I have to read what the purposes of marriage are in our tradition. And um, there's three, and they're in this order. I love that the first purpose of marriage is for the mutual joy of the couple. It's for joy, the sake of joy. And um, we like to remember that in the Gospel of John, in the Bible, Jesus' first miracle was changing water into wine at a wedding. Um, that Jesus showed up there um, 
and transformed what was ordinary into what was extraordinary and celebratory in wine. So a marriage is for the joy of the couple. It's for help and comfort given to one another in good times and in bad. And when it's the will of God for the gift of children and raising them in the Christian community. Um, now, I know it takes, it takes a lot to get to the wedding day and the requirements are really important. I can't marry somebody. They come to me um, and say, I want to get married tomorrow. Unless there's real extenuating circumstances, I can't do that. Um, it has to be at least 30 days. I have to meet with the couple for premarital counseling and instruction to talk about the purpose of marriage and even to work on some building blocks of marriage, like good communication skills. Um, at least one has to be a baptized Christian. I'm allowed to officiate at interfaith weddings as long as one um, one of the members of the couple is a baptized Christian. And um, like I said, at least two witnesses, and they have to be eligible according to state law. So I just looked up yesterday when I was looking about this. Do you know the minimum age for marriage in California? 16. There is no minimum age. Mm -hmm. You can get married at any age with the consent of the of parents, <laughs> which is interesting. But I, I, how rarely that happens, I don't know. But eight, the minimum age for divorce is 18. Oh, so anyhow. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, that's just uh, trivia, trivia okay. for everybody. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, so then in the ceremony itself, and I, I have an outdoor picture because more and more, and this is something that's changed in just the uh, 20 years that I've been ordained, um, more and more people are wanting to get married outside. So it'll be interesting to talk about um, if people are seeing that in other traditions. But it starts out where um, I talk about the purposes of marriage and publicly the free consent of both members of the couple has to be declared. So I ask them if they'd come here freely and without reservation to give themselves to each other in marriage. So it has to be um, completely free choice that brings the couple to the wedding. Um, at least one reading from Holy Scripture, and then the vows are exchanged. Rings do not have to be. The vow vows have to be said. Rings don't have to be exchanged, but generally are. And um, prayers and blessings. So I thought I'd go into each of those just a little bit. Um, reading from scripture is one way they can bring in family members or friends. Um, the couple chooses scriptures that meet, are very meaningful to them. Most, almost, almost always, they choose the famous reading from 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful. So um, there's at least usually one reading from scripture. And then the vows are made. And this is uh, the traditional vows. It's also getting more and more common for couples to write their own vows, which um, we don't allow. They have to say these vows. Now, they can, they can add on other things at another point in the ceremony, but th these vows have to be say, said in our tradition. Um, I take you, and they would say it's their name, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until we are parted by death. This is my solemn vow. So it's a lifelong uh, sacred promise to um, love, love the other person. So that's the vows. Yeah, I want to break the rule. Mm -hmm. What if you put, I want, I give myself to you? <clears throat> I give myself, uh, could you say that? Well, we'll talk about that. I mean, there can be some variations, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the ring. I give you this ring as a symbol of my vow, and with all that I am and all that I have, I honor you in the name of God, or in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So those are the words used in the exchange of rings. And then this, this is a little, um, a little piece of the Episcopal tradition, and let me know if this happened to anybody who was who was married in um, a Christian denomination, but tying the knot comes from the part of the service after the couple has exchanged vows and rings, then the priest, so I wear something called a stole, which you can see is a, um, is a garment, thin, a thin garment that goes over both shoulders, and I take the stole and I wrap it around the couple's hands, and when, um, 
when I say who God has joined together, let no one put asunder, my stole is wrapped around their hands, and that's where the term tying the knot comes from. <laughs> so, and people always find that interesting, so I thought I would, would share that. Um, and then after that part of the service, we have prayers, and the prayers are very illustrative of what we believe about marriage. So um, there's a prayer that the couple would have wisdom and devotion. There's a prayer that they would have grace and forgiveness when they hurt each other, not if, right? So it's just an acknowledgement that in human relationships, we do step on each other's toes. So when that happens, that there would be grace and forgiveness. And then um, my favorite today is the prayer for, for fulfillment. Give them such fulfillment of their mutual affection that they may reach out in love and concern for others. Um, and not to put you on the spot, but Tim and Terry, right? Here's a perfect example of a couple that is so uh, loving and connected to each other that they're able to serve the community in ways that are so beautiful, right? That's our hope for all marriages. Um, and that's why when we call marriage a vocation, it's not just be for the two themselves, but it's we believe that God has called these two people to be together because they can do in the community together what they couldn't do individually. That it's really how they live out love, which is the primary value of Christianity, to walk in love and live in love. So, um, and then the blessing. So, let their love for each other be a seal upon their hearts, a mantle about their shoulders, and a crown upon their foreheads. Bless them in their work and in their companionship, in their sleeping and in their waking, in their joys and in their sorrows, in their life and in their death. They're often kneeling, um, and sometimes the members of the congregation stretch out their hands, too, so the whole community is participating in the blessing. Um, I'll say in our denomination, starting in 2015, we legalized the marriage of same-sex couples, and that was following a long decades uh, process where same-sex relationships were blessed, but they weren't given the status of marriage. And then in 2015, um, all of the restrictions against that in our denomination were lifted. So um, it, in churches, you would have marriages, equivalent marriage ceremonies for same-sex couples. Um, so the Episcopal Church legalizes it, is, recognizes same-sex marriage, the Evangelical Lutheran Church, the United Church of Christ, um, some branches of the Presbyterian Church, some branches of the Methodist Church, and um, not all Christian denominations do, um, but many of the what's called mainline Christian churches do. Yeah. Um, and then just one other thing that I wanted to add there, I said before, like I, I do do interfaith weddings. So um, when I did a wedding with a rabbi, we shared different parts of the service and incorporated um, elements of the Jewish wedding ceremony as well as the Christian wedding ceremony. So as long as, um, I'm happy to do that, as long as um, the couple can will say the vows and um, receive the blessing. And just recently I did a wedding and the both both members of the couple were for, from a Mexican background and there's a tradition of the lasso where this figure eight, like, the, like a figure eight rope is put over one part of it over the one member of the couple and another part over the other member of the couple, and it means that they um, are a, a symbol of infinity. I, you know, I think so. That was important that they incorporate that, so it's fine to do that. And um, other cultural things that have been included before, uh, the unity candle. Some people remember that, where there's a big candle in the middle, and then two candles on the side, and then individual candles represent the in individuals in the couple. And then they'll light the can, uh, take their candle and light the center one together. And it used to be that they would blow out the individual candles, leaving the center candle. But now more and more, they're leaving the individual candles to show that um, the individuals in the relationship are still individuals, but they're also joined together. So that's been kind of the or the sand ceremony where. They take different color sand and they pour it in um, to a big container to show the mingling of their lives and of their families. Yeah. Love one another as I have loved you, Jesus said, and Christians believe that marriage is um, one way to really live that out in a day-to-day -day way. So, that's it.
a bit about Christian weddings. Thank you, Julie. If you can scoot over by table, we'll, we'll leave this. Um, there he is, Mohammed. Mohammed Shoyab Mertar is an imam in, Islamic, in the Islamic Center of Canal Valley in Thousand Oaks, California. He's our host tonight, in case you were wondering what center we're in. Uh, he's a regular guest speaker at local colleges and universities and works closely with police departments in order to share a better understanding of Islam. While in Utah, Muhammad has been a part of the yearly interfaith prayer sessions at the Utah Senate, representing the Muslims of Salt Lake City as an honored guest of the various mayors and the governor. He's active in presenting the Islam in a mild and moderate manner, and I might add with a good sense of humor. <laughs> Imam Mattar holds a degree in interpersonal and organizational communication. He has also memorized the Quran and has a degree in Islamic jurisprudence from Arabia Islamia, Johannesburg, South Africa. Through his writings, Imam Muhammad Shayab has contributed to the discussion of issues re relating to Muslims in the West and is an ardent about presenting contemporary Islamic thinking without letting go of core Islamic concepts and principles. He lectures extensively to student and secular groups with key issues being in the area of personal reform, social reform, protecting the environment from continual abuse, social justice, and the need for continual intercultural and interfaith dialogue. Mohammed, thank you so much for inviting us to be here and agreeing to be uh, the final speaker in this forum. Before I talk about marriage to you, I just want to cover with you certain statistics, and these are very important, is some of the pure research itself. And the reason why I want to share this with you is because one has to understand that marriage has a particular purpose. Let me give you an example in the creation. We believe, and, many, and by the way, as far as our two previous guests are concerned, there are a lot of similarities, not only between them, but between all three of us, including other faiths that may not be here. And you've seen this common thread throughout, for example, the concept of witnesses, the concept of compatibility, etc., etc. Why I share this with you is because when you look at the purpose of marriage from the time period of Adam and Eve, known in Arabic as Adam and Hawa, salam, peace be upon them both, God made it very, very clear according to scripture, or according to tradition, that if Adam was to be there, his level of contentment would have never been great and only became significant to him. The contentment factor, of course, is after the coming of Eve. So you're already seeing something very important. The traditional concept is being outlined. That is why in the Quran it says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنْفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجَةً And basically, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ means from the great signs of God. In that given page, God talks about from his signs, there are people that he created from different skin color. From his signs, there are people that speak different languages. From his signs, you see lightning and thunder. And thereafter, you see water coming down. And he talks about all his signs. And in there, he says, and from his signs is what? That he will create a spouse and a partner for you. Why? <clears throat> so you may live in tranquility with one another. <laughs> Complete the sentence for me. Do not take me for. Yeah. You know this woman said it faster than men? <laughs> <laughs> You're on the table here. Okay. Right? There's a reason for why the statement is very, very important. Because God is saying the purpose of your relationship is not to abuse and exploit one another. And yet we know statistically, the first person to abuse is who? Those that are closest to us. Whether it's our spouses, 
all our parents, or for that matter, our children, right? That's the reality we deal with. So God says something here, created for you spouses, why? So you may live in tranquility. It is only after living together in tranquility, despite being tested worse than the stock market curves, <laughs> that you are able to put your differences behind. God says, That love only comes after all those type of things that you endured. By the way, I'm not saying in your abuse. No, no, no. That is entirely Islam. Clearly says, That divorce is a reality. If you can live together with goodness, harmony, and peace, then by all means do. And perhaps if you cannot, and if you cannot live together in peace, then by all means, at that point in time, both of you have to go your way. It's not that misery loves company, number one. And number two, it never is. You know what? If you are seeking divorce, I'm going to get the best lawyer to put you around the ringer so both of us can be miserable because I'm not going to let you go. Religion says, just as being together is significant, sometimes moving each other's way is also very, very important. In the essence of time, let me just skip through quite a bit. Now, all these things result in something, right? And I'll talk about exactly what steps, like our beautiful, wonderful, amazing both guests have talked about the steps. But before I talk about those steps of marriage and how we do it, I just want to talk about the implications of marriage as intended by religion itself. Let me just give you some statistics, and this is not something that we made up. This is directly from Pew Report, and I'll leave this copy here. You are welcome to uh, thereafter Google it and find some of the copies out there. I just want to share with you highlights. The average Muslim home has in it approximately, anybody knows on a global level how many people in the home? Please don't scare me with crazy numbers, but anyway. Seven or eight. Very close, 6.4, 6. right? Yeah. 6.4, he does have a PhD. So 6.4, <laughs> followed thereafter by Hindus, thereafter by Christians 4.5, thereafter by Buddhists 3.9, and etc., etc., and Jews, of course, 3.7. Let me give you another important fact that came out from this article. Extended family households where relatives live, where they live with, for example, aunts, parents, grandparents, etc., all of them live together. It states here that as far as the Hindus are concerned, they are more inclined to the 55%. That is why there's another report that says they are far more wealthier than some of their counterparts. Well, no wonder you're living together, you're saving on a lot of things from food bills and everything. So it, it, all that adds up to mental security and family stability. And that is why also in America, Hindu folks are amongst one of the most High, uh, not, uh, how can I say, highly educated. In so it's all linked again to family. So don't just give me this Republican line family values. Show me with the numbers, of course. Nothing against Republican or Democrats. For that matter. Continuing further, there are they talks about the Buddhist folks, and there are they says in this category, Muslims are 36% inclined to this. There are they says the following. Oh, this is mind blowing. Worldwide, Jews are the most likely to live alone, 10% while Muslims and Hindus are least likely to live alone. Mm. And they are approximately 1%. That means they prefer and they will be, and some of you can attest to this as well. Let's skip right through. As far as most of this concerned, Christians are most likely to live in a single parent household. Mm. Roughly 6% of Christians live in homes with more than one parent and no other adults, including 11% of Christians in Christian families. So in other words, now when you look at the challenges that Christian families are facing around the world on multiple levels, it's linked to, again, what? Families. That is why you see all these demarcations of, well, we don't want abortion, or we don't want this, or we don't want that. It's all linked because they realize that it's affecting family. The average Christian family is how many? 1.93 to 2.2. The average Muslim family has how many? 6.4. No, no, no. Uh, 
uh, according to those statistics, uh, no. Children. Though. Exactly, children. Exactly. <laughs> That's the difference. The first one you are right. This one now, Muslims are likely to have two point nine. I don't know how to get a point nine with his eyeballs coming out, nothing else, but regardless. <laughs> so, by the way, now this has huge implications. This has huge implications because you're looking at roughly, let's say, 2.2 and 2.9, and over a period of time, now I'm going to make a political statement. No wonder, no wonder, certain things take place in certain countries to lower their rate of population. It's all linked in some capacity or the other. So may God protect one and all in this category. Now I'm coming to the next part. So I'll leave this here for you. By all means, you can glance at this. And all this, of course, is tied together in some capacity or the other. Before I go on any further, should be a question. How many percent of the Muslim population is in a polygamy type of relationship? Because there's a stereotype out there, right? Is this the United States or worldwide? Global. 130 countries, 20 million people, according to the Pew Research. Mm. So, Rashid, how many people? How many Muslim families percent wise? Less than 10 percent. Less than 10 percent? 5 percent. 5 percent? 1. 1 percent? Yes. I was mind blown. I was like, hey, somebody lied to me in America. Because I was mind blown. 1 percent. 1 percent. And, uh, it's a reality, so you can take a look. Now let me come to exactly, uh, how, what's the time right now? If you don't mind me asking. It's Okay, so I'll make it very, very brief, because they covered, fortunately, a lot of things. But now I'm just going to show you why our religion is the way it is. I showed you a lot of the outcomes, but let's go back now to what takes place in every, what I would call, ceremony. And greatly, and I cannot be thankful enough, our previous speaker, Outline enormous amount of things that you'll see a link towards in some capacity. There is what is known as the khutbah. What is khutbah, Sister Salma? She, she knows Arabic. That's good. <laughs> um, khutbah means basically a sermon. The Islamic sermon for weddings has in it basically three phrases of the Quran. And I'll run through that very, first, uh, very, very briefly. One is, Ya ayyuhan nasu ta'u rabbakum ulladhi khalakum khin nafsi wa'afidah. Meaning the following, O people, not just Muslims, but O people in general. And by the way, do you know what's the name of the surah? Surah means chapter. Anybody know? Take a guess. Not woman, the woman. Right? An-nisa, the woman. So God even knows when to say the woman for us folks. Because if... You just say woman without the word the and you're a married man, you're gonna get into a lot of trouble. <laughs> Having said that, it says, Ya and you and all people, number one, if tapu be conscious of your God. I want you to think about this. In every Islamic ceremony, these are the first words. Boy and girl are thinking of honeymoon, and God is saying, No, no, no. Before you <laughs> think of honeymoon, if tapu rabbatum, be conscious of your Lord. Why? For what purpose? He created you from a single origin point, Adam and Eve. And from there, he spread you throughout the world. He spread you throughout the world as what? Rijalaw wanisa. Spread you throughout the world as men and as women. God is passing a point here that marriage is not just for boys and girls. Right? So therefore, California not having an age, they're creating problems. And now you see why we're having teen pregnancies out there, etc. God is saying, marriage is serious business. And it is for men and women. Meaning, people that are to be responsible. That is why it says the following. A man and woman should only get married under the following condition. He can afford shelter. He can afford food and clothing. And he can also be able to not only communicate with her effectively, but give her emotional and mental support. Nowadays, when guys are playing video games at the age of 35, it's going to be quite hard. But regardless, that's what God is expecting of the man in that given relationship. And of course, as the woman, there's a hadith that says the following. Every individual will be questioned on the day of judgment. And a woman will also be questioned as to what she did in her environment, in her home, in as far as her relationship with her children is concerned. So that's one aspect. 
that is mentioned. The second aspect that is mentioned in every ceremony is that do justice to one another, live on faith to your best of your ability, and don't only live as people of faith, but live to the point wherein perhaps when God takes away your life, thereafter you'll also be part of the faith and you can be united once again. Then there is a third phrase that is mentioned in every ceremony. Where it says the following, Uru Paulan Sadila. Say loving things, say honest things, and say kind things to one another in your relationship. This is very, very important. Before we get married, the text messages are flying, and everything is just so hunky dory. And the day after marriage, hey, I got your man, what do I need to worry about now? Etc. etc. And God says, Don't do that. As a matter of fact, there was a TED talk that I heard. The average person lies how many times a day? The average, every day, I'm talking about just one day. Anybody knows the number? Ten. That's a little too much. Yeah. Closer to her. Five. Anywhere from three to seven. Anywhere from three to seven. So technically you are right as well. And I'm not even talking about a pathological lie. The average individual. Now some of you, of course, you've been there, done that, so you're not, you're, you're not going to lie because... Think about it. Once you're over 45, I don't think you should be lying anyway. But regardless, because you've done all your lying before that. But regardless, so God is saying here, Uru Paulan Sadira, that now that you are married, be honest and faithful and kind to one another, and don't do things that will rupture your relationship from here on. Now I just want to cover a few more things. So we have already covered the aspect of what is discussed in every ceremony. Number one. Number two, there is an aspect of consent. The bride, before she becomes a bride, she has to have, like our previous guest made mentioned, she has to have, in this case, it's she that must have it and not the guy. She has to come in with two individuals that will represent her. Guess what Islam also says? If there was a backdoor marriage where those two people represented her just to get her married, and later she goes to an Islamic judge and says, this is what happened to me. That means they forced me this marriage and it is good with me, etc. Automatically, they are now going to be liable to the point wherein the judge has the right to abrogate that marriage at her will and thereafter, those two people that are false witnesses to that marriage for the rest of her life, if she doesn't get married again, they have to sustain her, ensure that she's comfortable and she is going to be taken care of. Because Islam doesn't want marriage without not just her consent, but without her guardians as well. Of course, so we covered the consent and the witness aspect, which we saw similarities, unfortunately. Also, there is a role of what is known as the guardian. The father of the bride has to ensure that the person that is bringing into the bride's life, number one, is wealthier than the bride and more educated than the bride and will give the bride a better life then she's already accustomed to. This part is called Kufu, and it's a chapter of that on compatibility. So Islam, and this is by the way, not just an uh, Islamic thing, by the way, not just an Islamic thing. If you study the relationships in Europe in the 1800s, and in early America, this was no different. Where the guy will come, he'll ask, and he'll make sure, of course, he was of course, on a certain statue, and she doesn't have to be, it's not like he's going to be a billion and she's going to be just a dollar person. No, I'm talking about the compatibility. If he has 10 million, then she can have 5, 6, I mean, compatible. It's not that she must have 10 million and this guy must be broke as ever. That is now, because it's, it's going to take away the joy from her life, which means that she's not going to be able to focus on children in the future. And it's going to be bad breaking for her to be in that relationship. So that is why Islam, under ideal conditions, this takes place. Then there is a concept of ijab and kubur. Ijab and kubur is uh, the witnesses will be asked on her behalf and she will say to the witnesses, I've given myself in marriage. This is very important. It's not because she cannot answer herself. Those witnesses are going to be held accountable if there is any play that is taking place that is inappropriate. And of course, she's going to ask for uh, uh, what is known as mahar mahar. The English word is dowry, but in reality, it is mainly a gift that is given to her as a first gift in the relationship to open up her ideas of uh, being more confident, etc. 
So normally a guy will get well. Sometimes the guy is generally I've seen in local environments. Uh, it's not surprising for him to give, you know, a gold, a uh, couple of thousand dollars at minimum. This is her first spending. Anybody knows why he must give at least that much generally? So that way the guy can see the things that she loves to buy, those Godfather <laughs> chocolates or whatever it is, then he knows what's on her mind and then after he can continue. Uh, in other words, is to give her, now people have perverted this by the way, but the ideal condition, the ideal purpose of giving the mother that was to uh, give her confidence in this relationship and thereafter, uh, thereafter, how can I say, see her basic patterns and thereafter sustain it within the means of that given relationship as well. Of course, there is quite a few more other things, but I think in the essence of time, oh uh, uh, we'll call it uh, quits on this one. And of course, there are topics on rights and responsibilities. I've discussed that, alluded to that in passing as well. And this is very, very important. It goes on both sides, man to woman, woman to man, and also children to parents and parents to children and parents becoming the means of supporting this couple and it's the community's responsibility also as was mentioned previously by the gentleman wherein they must try to if they see issues within the couple don't put more you know uh, fire to it and sort of say you know what this guy doesn't deserve her anyway and she's too good for him and know somebody else but no 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 the idea is keep them linked so that relationship can develop and be fruitful later on Again, thank you all. I know it took a lot of time, but uh, I'm sure it's um, I've got a question, point of order question. That, that was wonderful. And by the way, if I followed those rules, I never would have gotten married because I was dirt poor when I got married. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's some food, and I don't know if we want to break and, and grab some food. Uh, I think it'll save a lot of time, and people are. Here. They probably are thinking of their wedding days and they're getting a little hungry, I think. Okay, <laughs> let's do that. Thank you so much for providing this. This is Thank provided you. by the Islamic Center. But we do want to come back and have Come back, bring, bring your food back to your chair, and we'll go ahead with the Q&A. Because you're getting two people from different backgrounds coming together. No, I can't get it. Yeah. My microphone. So once you have two people coming together from very different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people are not forthcoming with illnesses they may have. Uh, it could be medically related, it could be psychological, it could be trauma issues. And when one side conceals these things to the other side, this happens by the way, from time to time, not as often, not as common, then things will go in a wrongful direction at times. Sometimes it could be Let's just be blunt, we're all adults. Uh, we know that people have certain addictions in today's economy. So when they get married, there are certain things, unfortunately, due to the addictions, they cannot fulfill in the relationship. So then, now one partner is left hanging. So the question is, now what does Islam say? At the time the Prophet, peace be upon him, there was a woman that came to complain to the Prophet of Islam and says, you know what, I, I married this person, but uh, he's like a dead man in the bedroom. She said, it is like a dead man in the bedroom. The Prophet of Islam said, called that individual, had a conversation and said to her, you know what, he seems like a nice guy, you know, just stay with him. And, the, and she said, Prophet of Islam, I'm asking you a question. Are you telling me to stay with him as a command from God or are you telling me from your side? <laughs> the Prophet of Islam says, I'm telling you from my side. And she says, in that case, I want a divorce and let me go. <laughs> and she took a divorce and she moved on. So the point I'm trying to make here is that although divorce is something we don't like to talk about, religion uh, clearly outlines there is room for it. Now when it's taking place, as I mentioned in the phrase before, then we should not be tormenting one another further. She has rights. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Not only she has rights, there is a certain amount of payment period that he has to give as she is now going to go back to wherever she has come from or moving on to wherever she needs to move. There is a type of, we wouldn't use the word alimony in the sense that we have it in today's time, but there is a compensation factor that has to be brought into existence. If there are children until a certain age, the children can be with her 
Thereafter, it becomes again his responsibility. And if he doesn't want to take the responsibility, he can leave her with the children, but then he has to compensate her, etc. So what I'm trying to say is, Islam allows it. There is room for it, as you can see. Uh, and we should be not trigger happy just to go into it just because, you know what, I don't like her and let me move in, move on. No, I don't like him and I need to move on. Uh, so these are the various parameters in which it should be discussed and generally dealt with. Uh, depending, divorce is uh, very uh, limited. I mean, not that many as uh, openly these days. Uh, because uh, it's not like restriction any from the point of the Buddhism. There's no restrictions. By those we believe the main the word is karma. Karma is the main word to understanding if there's a certain last minute when it comes to the deeper level of divorce. We both all agree because of the karma. The karma, then we try best that they are poor. That's our karma. So that understanding. But also, it's not the divorce is very uh, not common. And it will take a long way to go, not like by co. Because it's uh, involved with the community and family value. Family value and also. Mostly, usually, it depends when they are married. They already establish the children. Once you have the children, family, family value, once you have this, with little some problems, they will be satisfied by your own individually and try to focus on your life and your future. Your, mostly, they focus on your children for future. And once the children grow up, the more important then they small things will be go away, understanding, and then they focus on their children. And that value is more important than your, your parents' value. That's, so that's kind of thing. Okay. Julie, what, what kind of uh, support is, is, do Christians offer to <coughs> the Jewish um, people? Well, again, there's a, a wide range within the Christian tradition. In the Episcopal Church, up until the year 2000, if a couple came to a priest, and said we're having problems in our marriage, the first responsibility of the priest was to try to have them reconcile. Mm -hmm. But in the year 2000, that canon law changed, and now the first responsibility of the priest is to ascertain the safety of both members of the couple. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that fits, one of the reasons why I became ordained was I heard stories about um, women who would go to their clergy person and say, you know, I'm being abused by my husband, mm -hmm what can I do? And that they would say, well, just go home and try to love him more. And I remember hearing that and thinking, I wonder if women were in the clergy position, if that would happen less often. Um, but of course, abuse isn't the only reason for divorce. So in the Episcopal Church in the 70s, in the 1970s, is when um, divorce and then remarriage became um, less restrictive. So um, if if somebody has been divorced and comes to me to get married, um, I have to ascertain that they're taking good care. Well, first, that they're definitely divorced, that it's, the legal divorce has happened, and um, that they're fulfilling their um, financial obligations to their previous spouse and children, um, and that they have a sense of what went wrong in their marriage and how um, they can help prevent that from happening again. And in the Lutheran tradition, in their book of pastoral care, they have um, prayers for uh, people who are going through divorce. Um, there's some beginnings of experiments with actually rituals of divorce. Um, so, you know, that's, that's interesting. It's kind of on the horizon right now in, um, in Christian, Christian rites. Yeah. Uh, so, so, uh, so nice that... Um, we come to a place now where we recognize divorce. I, I grew up in the church, of course, in the 60s, uh, 50s and 60s, and uh, they, my parents used to joke that you'd kill your spouse because you weren't allowed to divorce them. And of course, that was a joke, but um, the, the part about killing the spouse was a joke, but the part about not being allowed to divorce them wasn't a joke. Any other questions for each other? Well, what I've noticed is a lot of similarity between aspects of marriage and also aspects of divorce between traditional faiths. That means we are acknowledging one thing, 
that we all believe in one God and the rules that the God has outlined is very similar. That part I think we can all agree with. What's happening in all of us, and between all of us is when laws come into play and these laws are not quote unquote Christian, Jewish or Muslim in as far as the full parameters are concerned. In other words, we take Christianity but we treat it. And then we take Judaism and we treat it. And then we take Islam and we treat it. And we say we are reforming it. And then each generation is doing that. And eventually you look back and go, is that really Christian? Is that really Jewish? Is that really Muslim? And I think that's where we are right now. And, and, and people in America, by the way, are getting very frustrated with this. How do I know this? We have, on an average, 20,000 people yearly converting to Islam, number one. Out of that, how many percent do you think are women? 50? 75. 75. Right. 75. And most of these converts are who? Guess what? White women that are from wealthy backgrounds. So what the data is saying, uh, what the media is saying is one thing. The reality is something else. And my question is, how does a wealthy woman and a white woman convert to Islam? Because she has the ability to do what research. Which tells you and I, that when you tweak a religion too much, they are going to look for an alternative. I'm not saying Islam is perfect, by the way. I'll be the first one to say, we Muslims are not perfect. Islam is a religion, it's a separation, right? We'll say Christianity in its original form is perfect. Judaism in its original form is perfect. Islam in its original form will say it's perfect. But the faith holders are not doing justice to their given faith. Mm -hmm. So although we may have tremendous amount of similarities between marriage, divorce, or for that matter, even death, etc., uh, we are still in a struggle with quote, what I will say, quote unquote, with the corporations out there. And that is creating, I think, a lot of the issues that we are seeing. But at the end of the day, I mean, how much time do we spend at worship anyway? You know, on an average, we more at our work and our schools than connecting with God. And I think this has to be sort of re modified and understood. Otherwise, it's going to continue spiraling out unfortunately on a faith level and for that all I can say is so help me God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sponsors? We've got some questions from the audience. From the audience. Moment? Moment. 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 <clears throat> My question for the Christian. Uh, so, uh, my question was, you, you asked about the divorce and uh, We've all heard stories about Henry VIII. And, <laughs> yeah, so the Christian faith, originally the concept of divorce wasn't there. It was added up later. Is that how it, how um, did it come in? Right. Well, um, in scripture, so in the Christian scriptures, um, there, in one place, Jesus says, I don't permit divorce at all. In another place, it, it, Jesus says, I don't permit divorce except in the case of unchastity. So except in the case of adultery. So um, there already there was some differences within the Christian scriptures. So it, it um, I, I can't say it was Henry VIII, you know, who was the first, who was the first ever, because the Pope before Henry VIII had granted a divorce, right? That it was the church, church authorities could grant divorce. Um, but it was very inconsistently practiced and um, was corrupt. So it was often, if it was in the Pope's political interest, the Pope would grant the divorce. So um, Henry VIII wasn't able to win a divorce from the Pope. So unfortunately, we had a lot, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so the concept was there from the Jesus time. Yes. It was not practiced. It, right. Yeah. I really appreciate the clarification because many of us have this idea out of the Christian faith that until you die, in other words, you're going to be together. And this clarification, I think, made a very big difference. I think. Yeah. I thank you. Mm -hmm. Maybe I missed. Uh, maybe I missed. Uh, in the Islamic, what age you can be married? There is what is known as, see, unfortunately. What we hear out there, oh, you can get married at any age, etc. And I, I don't know if 
I alluded to this in my talk a little bit where I said, for example, if a woman is married off and she does not want to be married off, then there are consequences that are to be meted out later upon the given group. Same thing with a woman. <clears throat> we have to look at number one, what is not only the woman, women and men, what is their level of understanding and compatibility and mental balance between the both. Mm -hmm. And once they have that, then the guardians together should assist them in moving forward. According to some, based on this criteria, because societies change and they develop, the minimum age right now, although you cannot quote me on this because it's not like an official law, the average person only becomes mentally balanced Generally, a woman roughly at the age of 21, and for men roughly at the age of 24, 25. <laughs> so before that, we recommend that they don't do it. That puts us in the dilemma that everybody has this puppy love thing that goes on nowadays, <laughs> especially with Instagram and whatnot. And all of a sudden, you'll see a 19-year-old guy with an 18-year-old girl, and they want to get married, and you try to explain to them that this is not the best thing you should be doing based on the data out there. But at the same time, the reason why we have to still get them married is because if you don't, then they are going to be in a state of what is known as adultery. Mm -hmm. Adultery is defined as having a relationship out of marriage mm -hmm. for us. And that is even worse. That is even worse. Mm -hmm. So although we don't have a fixed age necessarily, mm -hmm. uh, the key criterion is you must be having, you must be able to afford shelter, clothing, food, give emotional stability, which is by the way, from the jurisprudence itself, we gather this. So it's not like something I'm just making up in this, in this 2023 to impress upon the audience. This has been mentioned by a scholar by the name of uh, Qurtubi, where he says, these are the criteria. He even adds on a further criteria, that a man must be able to do all these things and fulfill her desires. And likewise, she too must be able to fulfill the man's desires, because that is what married life is all about. So all these things, once they are met, then they can go ahead and get married. But that's not what we hear out there. And also, to be fair, the reason why many people don't mention all this is because you have also what is known as cultural issues, where they say, oh, you're a girl, you like sex, naughty girl. No, you cannot. Oh, you're a guy. God, you've got a dirty mind. Is that why you want to get married? So why else do you get married? <laughs> Think about it. Because you have certain things that you need fulfilled emotional well-being, social well-being, political well-being, e economic, etc, etc. So Islam is saying, once you are mature enough to do all this, then by all means proceed. So there may not be an age, but if all these things can be met, we generally, we will say in today's time, 25, 35, somewhere around there, these things can be fulfilled. Once that is done, you go forward. I don't think that makes sense. Yeah. Now is this followed, or that's a separate issue? <laughs> <laughs> Greg, you had a question. I, I have a question about the Buddhist marriage tradition. I understood you to say that um, that if a couple wants to get married, it has to be approved by their family and their mm -hmm. community. What happens when it isn't approved? The, does the couple ever marry anyway, or do they abide by the wishes of, of their family and community? Yeah, I think uh, approval is, uh, it might take a time. Uh, uh, take the time to approve all certain things. Sometimes they don't, the family don't agree, or they sometimes uh, the couple they are in love, but the parents have a more understanding of their backgrounds, other side of the background, so they have to go. Uh, and it's not like right now, but they have to be compromised and they have to see the, what the weakness of the thing. And uh, 90% inside would agree. But certain times there is no agreement, then we believe I told you then they will have a, some kind of like a middle person here discuss with the both sides and then then the ones they're realizing, then the compromise they both realize is our karma. That's the karma. So no matter what how much we have a love or we have tried, there's certain negative. That's what we can't connect it. So that's mm -hmm. our past past life karma. So blame on the past life, and then they go on the night next journey. Uh, it, it happens. Uh, mostly, because, uh, 
and uh, through the rule, the Buddhist rule, they know that the law yeah, the, in the pants has to be uh, approved, or pants has to be not like that kind of rule, but there is a very strongly culturally and the society is very important to pants has to because the pants who, because they have, I think because of the pants who are the, take the responsibility, they eat on both sides. And then I told you the community. Community wants their, uh, all these kind of thing meeting is not only true in, in, in parents, it's your community. Mm -hmm. Community is a witness is a, the most important to make the uh, equally, they're not going to be that side, this side. So they are to make the connection to make the uh, right. They believe if they find out something, this is not going to be a, uh, uh, doing well, then they have a kind of like a they will show you the more consulting part of the say, okay, that's a karma, so then you just have to go to the next level. Yeah. I want to put that, put a similar question to you, uh, Imam. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, what percentage of Islamic marriages are arranged? Actually, it is not just arranged, because many people have this idea that Islamic marriages are arranged since childhood, etc. There is a very simple rule. Even if it was arranged, they are children. And I'm just using the extreme example. When a girl is mature, and if she says to her parents, I don't want to go through with this, automatically it comes to an end, according to religion. Now, if it goes on further, that's not because of Islam, it's because of the culture that is imposing that given aspect, number one. Number two, that's a very good question you've asked. In Islam, for example, can a person get married without parental consent? This already has been discussed. There's one opinion that says no, and one opinion that says yes, kind of how you discussed before. And the opinion, correct opinion that we will say is yeah. the circumstances. For example, a 15-year-old girl comes, 16, 17, 18, 19 year old girl comes and says, I want to get married. Right? Just saying in close cultures, they can get married at age. Even 20. She I want to get married. She looks attractive, she's good looking. And that situation that Imam can say, no, I don't need to get you married. Why? Because your parents are saying no. And obviously, if you are an attractive 20 year old, anybody else will also get you married, especially when we see the guy being incompatible. On the other hand, let's say a woman that's 33 comes forward, 34 and says, I need to get married if my dad is saying no. In that case, we will say, you know what? If you're gonna keep on waiting, you're not going to get more opportunities because as you get older and older, you, you need to procreate, you need to have children, you want to move on. Uh, and she says, I have these needs. Then in that case, we'll say, we'll call the parent up and say, look, uh, why don't you want your daughter to get married? Well, because the guy is not a doctor or the guy is not, this, by the way, has happened. The guy is not highly educated enough. Well, unfortunately or fortunately, she has found someone and she wants to move on. So whether you give her your blessings or not, we are going to move on, so it is better you just bite the bullet, give your blessings, you are happy, and that way you don't make her feel guilty as well, and you move on. So for us, it depends on the situation and what it requires. And by the way, this is not again my ruling, it's the religion itself. The famous phrase is, La nikah bi wali. There is no nikah wedding without a guardian. And doing so is qabi. Qabi is a wretched act. But then again, what is more wretched? Then eloping and messing around or not getting them married. Mm -hmm. When you win the boat, eloping, running away is more worse. Therefore, in that condition, it's better to just get them married and thereafter move on. More questions from the audience? Oh, that's it's kind of an odd one, but like, is there a tradition of a honeymoon in Buddhist culture or in, is, it, is that a, is that a, Western Universal thing, thing or is that a Western thing? In, in, I mean, depending on side, there's no honeymoon. Once you meet together from, from today, tomorrow, your family, one family, there's no honeymoon to go. But more, but we don't call honeymoon, but don't call honeymoon, but they call spiritual, uh, spiritual journey. Basically, that means they will hands and the, the new wearing couple, they will take a journey 
through the different, like for example, if you live in a village, they go to Hasa, the capital, where the Dalai the temple, they go to temple. So, so it's kind of like a honeymoon. <coughs> like we don't call it. So basically, they take that. Uh, uh, the reason why they go to the pilgrimage, because the pilgrimage will bring you the more positive energy. And then, same time, these two new people have a more time to, to gather, mm -hmm. and then together, and to understanding the, your view and the value of your life. And then, that's how they spend your time with the spiritual tour, and they come back and get more time with your family. Mm -hmm. Well, that's it. <coughs> yeah. well, well, and it's so interesting, right? The question of what's culture and what's religion. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing essentially Christian about a honeymoon, but because the dominant culture has has been in this country American, you know, we tend to associate the Christian wedding ritual that I went through and ending with a honeymoon. But yeah, so nothing. How about a diamond ring? Right, diamond ring. That's culture. Let me just give you a quick answer for that. Because like, they asked, uh, there was there's a person by the name of Ali. Ali was the family of the Prophet of Islam. They asked him what is marriage. He said it's the following. Give your gift, that means the gift when you get married, number one. Surur al enjoy for a month. And thereafter he says, work hard, break your back, and then go to the grave. So I have a question for the mom. Um, if I understood it correctly, you were saying that when the, the, the girl comes to get married, she has two witnesses, which the implication was that they're vowing that she's pure and that she's been a good girl. And no, 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 no. They're vowing that she wants to marry and she is content in marrying a certain individual. And they are taking the responsibility that once she gets married, they will be in her best interest. And if something, like the other men, members also mentioned, and if something goes wrong, they will be negotiators in her favor without taking her side or being against a balanced, moral individual that wishes well for her and her new relationship. That's the purpose of those two women. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll yes. sort that out. But my next my related question to that was, you said, and maybe I didn't clear it until you hear it, if neither of them, I thought you said, spoke honorably or spoke correctly, did something, then if that comes out later, the judge can dissolve the marriage. Yes, now let's say for example, those two witnesses got her married without her full consent. And later it came out and she says, no, I didn't marry so and so. I don't know how you got me married. Pressure. Yeah, pressure or whatever. And she can prove that. Yes, then they will be held liable uh, in the court of uh, the Islamic, if there is such a thing in the war, but that given the courtroom, they will be liable entirely for that. That they had pressured her, she did not want to get married. Why did you do that to her? Okay, here's the ultimate question. Um, the world is getting crazy and crazy. People are cheating and lying and doing things for all sorts of immoral reasons. So the, the question is, have you, how, first of all, how often does that actually occur? And is it occurring more or less as time has moved from the past to the present? In my over 20 years, I have never seen anyone, uh, I mean, I've been to so many weddings. I've never seen a case that was brought forth to me wherein any individual, male or female, had been pressured to get married to a given individual. I have not seen that as of yet. And if that ever comes forth, then definitely number one, we'll take it straight to the law itself. And number two, we will work towards abrogating it and holding that person accountable to the maximum of the law itself. <coughs> that is it. We've never seen that situation in modern times. But, but, then, but then I'd like to lean on you a little more about, you obviously are very aware of the Islamic tradition you know, worldwide. So open the question up to beyond just your personal experience. Have you heard and what percentage of what's going on like that? I have a, a percentage would be very, very hard to say. Uh, I know we hear of, I hear these type of reports in the media, etc. that this is occurring. Okay. But I also hear 
other things in the media, for example, mm -hmm. just, just not to go off them too much. In America, the, uh, it's on the media, by the way, wealthy people that marry people that are very young in certain states. Right now, millionaires in America are marrying girls that are 15 and 16 years of age. Right. So this is not, I think, a religious problem. This is, I think, a human problem mm -hmm. to control another entity to fulfill their personal pleasures and desires. But I think Sister Salma has a point. I just wanted to address something that he says, he said war by the Islamic religion, that, she, that you said, you have to use Islam with the culture. And you there can be certain cultures that might um, pressure the girl to marry, but Islamically speaking, that is not unacceptable. She has to give her consent. She has to be okay with this marriage. Culturally, that's, we should not be with it. I mean, the world is just going crazy. So. <laughs> it's hard to parse. It's hard to parse culture. It's not just religions a lot of the time. Or Sean? Mm -hmm. uh, um, I don't know if it's time yet, but uh, just a question for uh, Tepo and Imam Muhammad's um, sister, Julia Foster Bond, um, same sex marriage. There is no restriction, but that's same-sex marriage. They, they, in according to the Buddhist and Tibetan faith, they said there's no restrictions. But culturally, in Tibet, in a good way, until I think uh, way new now, uh, now they are there. Okay? Tibetan Buddhists uh, also have a same-sex marriage. But uh, there's no restriction, but uh, culturally, they uh, never have mostly the family. It also doesn't mean family very doesn't mean there's a, uh, in the Buddhism there will be, cannot be a same sex marriage. It's just one of basically left open. And uh, so there are some uh, uh, same sex marriage in, in once now, the, the more, more people come to accept marriage. But uh, before in Tibet, they very hardly seen same sex there are, might have, they might have some same sex marriage live together, but maybe there's not like a uh, celebrating like a, as a couple, you know. But, but uh, in the Buddhism, traditionally, there is no restriction. They didn't say yes, they didn't say no, they just said yes. As far as it's a more question that you've asked, number one, people have desires, whether it's Muslim or non-Muslim, and people have inclinations. That's something that is part of human nature. And God has given everyone a different test. Uh, some those that are married, they would have the test of must they cheat or not cheat? Must they uh, lie? So everyone is going through some test or the other. And we believe as Muslims, if a person is gay or a lesbian, that's a test that they are going through. And that's a struggle that they are going through. And how they overcome that struggle, just like any other struggle, uh, is also important because it is considered a type of struggle if they overcome to the best of their ability, it gets them closer to God. We cannot judge individuals that are that way and we let everyone do whatever they wish to do and as far as their personal lives are concerned. That's a standard, and, and by the way, I'm not trying to give you a 2023 response because this type of lifestyle, it's in, even if you look at any Islamic country, there are people that are inclined to this type of uh, lifestyle choice, right? It's a reality. And I can break down country names and tell you exactly uh, how they have been tolerant towards these choices that their members have made. So this is not something that you cannot Google and find out. That brings me now to the third point. As far as conducting a ceremony is concerned, that we cannot do because, as I said in the beginning, where God said, I created Adam and Eve, number one, and if it wasn't for Eve, there would have not been comfort and the procreation and the continuation of progeny. So therefore, the traditional Islamic ruling is that knowing full well that every human is going to go through a struggle, whether it's people that are gay, 
or whether it's people that are in uh, heterosexual relationships, <laughs> whether it's the wealthy or whether it's the poor, whether it's the light skin or whether it's the dark skin. Challenges is something every human is going to go through. And they have to find a way to overcome that, to better connect with their creator. Uh, that is something that Islam, I think, holds as an opinion. And as far as conducting these type of ceremonies are concerned, naturally, uh, we cannot do it because the template being is between in the example of Adam and Eve and the purpose we believe uh, of male and female and the ideal conditions is to procreate and leave behind an amazing legacy of your faith, of your culture and your goodness. Now whether all these things are happening or not, that's a separate issue, but that's the purpose of our religion itself. One more question from you and then we'll, we'll call it a night. Caroline? Carrie's got a question. No. <laughs> I just have a reminder. Great. Um, thank you so much for being with us and for your presentation. And uh, Imam and Sama, thank you for the lovely food. And uh, you really didn't have to do that, but we so appreciate it. Likewise. And Terry, it's all yours. So again, a reminder, be watching for the email about the Keys to Faith. November 5th, it will be at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Camarillo at 1201 Paseo Camarillo. So it will be, I think we decided on $30 for adults because inflation has hit us. Sorry if it has been passed along. If you pay by a certain time, and that will be sent out of the email. So I hope to see you there. And then in January, we will have, we haven't determined where, but we will hear about the introduction to Hinduism um, by our Hindu member here. So it will be Hindu members. Uh, me too, <laughs> Brajani and Mashvera, for uh, on January 16th. Did I get it right? Close, you're getting closer. <laughs> <laughs> so again, thank you, Imam and Salma, and your hospitality.